Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. Alcatraz, cell 14D. The cell, of course, is empty today. This island prison was closed back in 1963. 14D was known as the hole, isolation, solitary confinement. It was one of the loneliest places on earth, except for the unfortunate few, those who were not alone who were locked in that cage with a visitor unwelcome. Just imagine you are an inmate inside those concrete walls. It's Alcatraz after lights out. The guards have already gone cell to cell for bed check. The cold bars enclosing the increasingly cold isolation cell, 14D. You are just another inmate trying to sleep somewhere down the row. And then you hear this. As the story goes, one inmate was given three years in the hole after trying to escape. Rufus McCain, he begged and pleaded to be housed elsewhere, anywhere, but 14D. He pleaded and petitioned the guards every day, please move me to another cell. And yet this isolation chamber would be his prison within the prison for three years. Over 150 weeks, 1,000 days, roughly 8,000 hours of night, with barely a wink of sleep. His only companion beyond the guards was his unwelcome guest. After those three interminable years, he was finally released from solitary, and the inmates would say Rufus McCain had become a shell of a man. It was as if he had vacated his mind of everything, just so he wouldn't have to think about what he had seen and heard and felt. He wouldn't have to endure the horror anymore. 
And yet horror would continue to follow McCain. He would soon be killed by another inmate with a painter's blade on the 3rd of December 1940. Another monster in the halls of Alcatraz. Why this place? Why this prison? Many believe that it's simply the nature of human nature. If you're going to house some of the world's most dangerous people, and according to some reports, further punish all troublemakers with no heat, no running water, no mattresses, and only holes in the concrete for toilets, there is going to be unrest. The spirit of that place will never be at peace. The physical and the extra-natural world bleeding into each other. Perhaps this explains the unwanted guest, the ghost, the creature of 14D. Alcatraz today is for tourism, yet even those who visit say that they hear cell doors close when none are closing. They hear laughing in empty halls. They feel unnatural chills in warm cells. And some say they have heard disembodied screams. Torment in isolation. The taunting of demons, the open mouths and burning eyes of monsters unknown. Echoes of those with a life sentence which had become a death sentence within the tiny walls of 14D. It's a long, long road trip through the state of Nevada. You've been staring at the highway's white line for hours and hours until the car begins to drift. You can't even keep your eyes open. It's been too long, too late. It's time to pull over. You scan the horizon for a motel sign anywhere up ahead. And then finally, there it is. An oasis in a tiny town called Tonopah, almost halfway between Las Vegas and Reno. But something is different about the motel sign out front. Filling the top half of that sign is a painting. The painting of a clown. Now... It's at this moment that you consider sleeping in your car. But a hidden force, maybe just curiosity, pushes you toward the entry door and into the lobby. You are greeted by a life-sized clown sitting in a chair. All around it are dozens of other tiny figures in makeup and wigs. The office is filled with painted eyes staring you down. Welcome, vacancy, your room is waiting. This Jesters of Horror House was inspired by a man and collector named Clarence Davis. He had accumulated in his life no fewer than 150 clown dolls and statues. And after his death, his children, Leona and Leroy Davis, wanted to preserve his memory. 
And so they built their monuments in that 2,400-person town in Nevada back in 1985. They built the Clown Motel. And oh yes, your room has clowns. So many clowns. All 31 rooms feature at least two custom clown art pieces. Rooms 108, 111, 210, and 214. These rooms are said to be haunted. Many believe that these are spirits who have walked to those rooms from the nearby Old Tonopah Cemetery, a gravesite populated by so many silver mine workers who burned to death in the Belmont Mine Fire of 1911. They died underground. They were buried underground. But in those white-painted, red-nosed, big-toothed, long-fingered statues, the dead can, for just a few moments in the darkness of night, remember what it was like to be alive. And there you are. You are tucked into bed, with lights off and only the faint glow of the street sign grazing your curtain. That glow faintly reveals the mural on the wall to your left, only three feet separating your bed from the figure, a clown painted almost to the top of the ceiling, taller than you, red hair, white shirt, yellow suspenders, squinting slits for eyes, resting deep within a narrow head, and a smile that feels like a threat. This clown is holding a red balloon. You turn your head away. Was that a sound? You cover your eyes in the red and white pillows. Did something just touch you? You turn on the television to mask the loud silence. Are the eyes of the painted clown now pointed there or there? or back here. You get up and wash your face in the sink. What was that in the mirror? You wander back and click off the lamp. The shadows seem different. And then finally you acknowledge your unwelcome guest with words spoken out loud. We're in this together. I won't move if you won't. Good night until light, let me rest without fright. Smile but don't bite, be my angel in white. You know, it's interesting to hear from those who stay at the Clown Motel. Some can't and won't remain in their rooms. Others are filled with wonder and delight and a feeling of welcome. Many ask for one of the themed rooms, the Friday the 13th room, the Halloween room, the Exorcist room, the It room. And in all of the 31 rooms, guests have reported strange things, knocks on the door, voices in adjacent rooms not occupied at the time, waking up to see newly carved scratches upon the wall, Laughing sounds from a spouse or partner or child or friend still fast asleep in their bed. <laughs> Would you, could you, stay all night at the Clown Motel? With the dolls and mannequins and signs and paintings, and a lobby filled with over 2,000 clown figures to greet you. It's not expensive if you would like to find out. The cheapest room is $85. The most expensive is $150. Just remember when you log the number of guests for your stay, expect one or two more, or three or four, and try not to run if you see a frown on your clown.
Antigonish by William Hughes Mearns. Yesterday upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. I wish, I wish he'd go away. When I came home last night at three, the man was waiting there for me. But when I looked around the hall, I couldn't see him there at all. Go away, go away, don't you come back anymore. Go away, go away, and please don't slam the door. Last night I saw upon the stair a little man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. What I am about to recount for you is absolutely true. And I'm not saying that to try to build credibility or tension like this is a true story. I mean, this actually happened. But I found it so chilling and so compelling, I wanted to include it here. It is the story of 19-year-old Brandon Swanson. The date was May 13th, 2008. Brandon was out with some friends at a party. They were celebrating the end of the spring semester at Minnesota West Community and Technical College. Brandon had had a few drinks, but his buddy said he was not visibly intoxicated by the time the party was winding down. This is just before midnight. Brandon hopped in his car and began the 30-mile drive home. He still lived with his parents, so that's 30 miles driving on rural Minnesota roads. Call that 45 minutes or an hour-long drive to arrive home at 1 a.m. But it was 2 a.m. when his parents, Brian and Annette Swanson, at home asleep in their beds, received a phone call from Brandon. He said he'd driven his Chevy Lumina off the road and into a ditch. He couldn't get the car out. It was absolutely stuck. He was not injured, but he was going to need his mom and dad to come pick him up. And so Brian and Annette got in their pickup and they drove in the middle of the night toward that spot where they estimated Brandon to be. They kept their son on the phone. From time to time, the call would drop out and he would call them or they would call him to reconnect. Brandon flashed the headlights, trying to signal them to bring them in. They drove road after road, turn after turn, yet they never saw any flashing headlights. And finally, after about 40 minutes, Brandon got frustrated. He looked off in the distance and saw some tiny lights, and he thought those might be the lights from a town called Lind, L-Y-N-D, Lind. And he said, I'm going to walk toward Lind, There's a bar on the outside of town. I'm going to wait for you in the parking lot of that bar. Pick me up there. Brandon kept mom and dad on the cell phone as he walked toward what he thought was the town of Lind. And it was between 2.30 and 3 in the morning as he had been on the phone with his parents for 47 minutes. He was saying something. He all of a sudden interrupted himself with the words, Oh, shit. And then he went silent. There was no sound of a click or disconnect, only silence. And his parents were saying, Brandon, Brandon, are you there? Can you hear us say something? But no one said anything. They disconnected that call and dialed him back, immediately went to voicemail. His father proceeded to the parking lot of that bar at Lind. Brandon was not there. They drove for miles on the roads all around Lind. Brandon was not there. They eventually did find the car. The Chevy was lodged in a ditch just off of a road between the towns of Porter and Taunton. But Brandon was not found. Brandon was never found. He was never seen again. 
Had he mistaken some other kind of distant light for the town of Lind and somehow wandered into calamity? There was no sign of foul play at the vehicle. Air surveillance teams eventually brought in. They found nothing. Search dogs led officers roughly three miles away from the ditch to Yellow Medicine River. The river was flowing fast and high after some heavy rains, and it was there that the dogs lost the scent. And teams walked up and down the riverbanks for miles, no sign. Cadaver dogs brought to the region they searched for three weeks, nothing. Brandon Swanson had simply vanished into the rural farmlands and back roads of Minnesota. And it's possible that his remains are out there somewhere. Officials designated a 140-square-mile grid for the search, but there were some farmers who didn't want outsiders trampling onto their land during planting and harvesting season. And for that reason, there are places that remain unchecked to this day. It was not and is not suspected that Brandon, for some reason, orchestrated his own disappearance, perhaps faking his own death, His parents, extended family, and friends reported no signs of cognitive impairment, mental illness, or even unhappiness at home. One night, he was simply there, and then he was gone. It has been a decade and a half, and search teams working with the county sheriff's office will still go out today and comb through the fields when harvesting season allows. Every once in a long while, the tip line will ring. Those tips have not produced anything so far. And to date, no physical evidence of Brandon has ever been found. His cell phone, his car keys, remnants of clothing, nothing. Absolutely no trace at all. How and why did Brandon Swanson just vanish in the middle of the night on the 14th of May, 2008? This remains a mystery unsolved, a tragedy unexplained, and a baffling true story. For just a few minutes here, I want to talk a little bit about fear. Fear has a name. It has many names, and it's possible that one of these fears lurks behind your wide eyes and quivering lips. I used to have this recurring dream when I was a teenager. Back then, I was a total night owl, so everybody else, mom and dad and my sisters, would go to bed well before me, and I would stay up. I was watching television or on the phone with my girlfriend or whatever, And finally, when I got tired enough to go to sleep, it was my job to make sure that the front and the back doors were locked. Now, do you ever have a strange dream and realize in the dream that you are dreaming? Very often, I think it's the surreal stuff that tips you off. Oh, look, there is Taylor Swift, and she's singing the Oscar Mayer hot dog jingle, and she's sitting on a luck dragon that has the head of Al Pacino, that kind of thing. You realize, okay, I know I'm in a dream. I realize that this is not real. But that was not the case with my recurring dream. It felt absolutely authentic. Everything looked and felt like real life. And so there I was, late at night, my eyes getting so very heavy. And finally, after midnight, I decided it was time to call it a day. And so I got up and I did my routine. I went to the front door and I tugged on the door to make sure it was latched, and then I turned the doorknob lock and the deadbolt. And after the front door, I walked to the back of the house, but when I tugged on the back door, it had not been latched, and that door swung in toward me so quickly that it made me jump. And standing in that doorway was a tall, looming figure cloaked, In black. In the dream, I couldn't tell if it was 
black fabric or just a person made of shadow. It was so bizarre. His face was not covered. I couldn't see a face, though. I couldn't see anything other than darkness. I couldn't even see his eyes. He just stood there, filling that door frame with his massive size. And in that moment, I already knew he was coming inside my house. He was coming after me. And it all happened so fast. It happened in just a second. Surprise and shock and panic. And I would wake up in that same surprise and shock and panic. And often I couldn't get back to sleep for a very long time. Did I have a condition called cellarophobia? The irrational fear of a stranger in my house. I don't think so. The idea hadn't really occurred to me during the day. It wasn't something I thought about. But I will tell you this. After the first two times I had that dream, locking the house in real life caused real anxiety. Every time I walked toward that back door and tugged on it to ensure that it was latched, I had a moment where I thought, there's something on the other side. There are so many phobias in this world There is cholera phobia, the fear of clowns. I did an entire ghost story about a clown on the podcast and in my Ghost Stories audio book. Today's show has already featured the Clown Motel. And it's interesting to note how clowns have become personal nightmares for so many. I always feel a little bit sad for legitimate clown characters who only want to bring joy to parties and people, you know, the party clown people who may not always feel the welcome they deserve when they show up in a clown costume. Psychology Today says that cholerophobia is the result of our brains fearing the unpredictable. Makeup on the face, Strange paints on the smiles and cheeks and eyes, these make it difficult for us to perceive true emotion, sincere intent. The silly antics of the clown seem so unnatural to us, and so our brains trigger and we become suspicious. It's all a facade. This is an act. There is another agenda. For 12% of the population, Clowns are no laughing matter. Fear of the dark. Nyctophobia. That's another common one. You ever walk upstairs after turning off all the downstairs lights and you walk those stairs really quickly to make sure the boogeyman can't catch you? There is a terrifying Ryan Reynolds film. This released back in 2010. The movie is called Buried. It is a survival thriller that is very much not the usual comedy fare that we're used to seeing from Ryan Reynolds. The entire movie takes place inside a coffin. Now, Natalie and I rented this movie shortly after it released. I am astounded that she even made it through. After the first 10 minutes, she was looking at me going, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can do this. And yet somehow she persevered. Scientists know how the human brain resists notions of prolonged suffering and dying alone. Scalophobia types would hate my Halloween yard display, which is filled with plastic skeletons. Many people recoiling at the very idea of anything looking dead or dying things. In fact, our fears of death has a name, thanatophobia. I recently found out that there is a clinical name for the fear of Halloween, the October 31st holiday, Samhainophobia. Now remember that the Celtic New Year was long ago marked by the Festival of Samhain, at the celebration of the harvest. The Celts believed that this was a time when the supernatural plane and the physical world almost merged together. There was a veil, a very thin veil, between the living and the ghostly. 
that veil so thin that the dead could actually slip into the physical world to walk among the living. Many people would anticipate this, sometimes fearing this. They would leave gifts or treats for these spirits. And as some were mischievous and quite frightening, the goodies might distract them or appease them and make them go away. Other people disguised themselves in costumes so that dead relatives might simply walk on by. Perhaps salwanophobia reflects that aversion to anything death. Or maybe, as part of a highly Christian culture, they're nervous about any ancient ritual involving spirits that does not exist in Christian doctrine or tradition. Halloween has long been warned about by the Puritans, steeped in satanic panic. My own childhood was filled with horror stories about evil people out there poisoning Halloween candy and putting razor blades inside apples and stealing black cats for the purpose of sacrifice and even stealing people, often children, for the very same reason. It's ironic, then, that the word Halloween is actually a Catholic invention. About 1,200 years ago, after the Romans had conquered the Celts, the Catholic Church was not pleased that so many of the common people were enjoying these pagan festivals. Around 600 CE, Pope Gregory I decided that Rather than try to outlaw these godless traditions, the Catholic Church would simply adopt them and modify them to religify them. Pagan ritual would transform into Catholic ritual. Pagan temples could become Catholic temples. And 300 years after that, the Church moved its All Saints Day ritual from earlier in the year to the first of November, All Saints Day, All Souls Day, All Hallows Day, and as such, the day before November 1st, which was, of course, October 31st, well, that would become All Souls Eve, All Hallows Eve, Halloween. One theory held by some historians says that the Middle Ages saw the church version of trick-or-treating it was called souling, where poor people would collect food and money from neighboring homes in return for prayers for the dead. And yet the true spirit of Halloween would simply not die. Those pumpkins with candles inside still echo today that Celt symbolism of the magic of the sun over the harvest. In Ireland and Scotland, carved vegetables were made to scare off a trickster named Stingy Jack. And thus, we got the Jack-O-Lantern. The colors of black and orange trace way back to that ancient Samhain festival, black representing the death of summer, orange representing the autumn harvest season. Oh, how could anyone be afraid of this wonderful holiday? Today, the second most popular and profitable holiday after Christmas. Apparently, many people still are. Perhaps all they need is a smile and a costume and a candle and a delicious treat to change their petrified perceptions. I hope you feel the spirit of the season on our annual Ghost Stories podcast as we head toward the Halloween holiday. There are more stories to come next.
Halloween is upon us. It's Ghost Stories 2023, and we're just having some fun this week. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, I hear a lot of people, they send me emails, and they're like, when's Ghost Stories? We can't wait. And other people are like, eh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see you later. Yeah, whatever, whatever floats your boat. But uh, it's fun for me. It's fun to be a storyteller in this way, and Halloween's always a blast. I'm, I've set a high bar. In my neighborhood, it's either a high bar or a low bar for Halloween decorations. And everybody else, they've got the little skull sitting on the porch, and they've got a couple of hanging bats in the window, and maybe there's an inflatable something, a pumpkin in the front yard. Me, I go down to Lowe's hardware store, and I buy some cheap lumber and silver spray paint. And I make an otherworldly prison. Friend of mine builds an electric chair out of old pallet wood. And then I enhanced it. So he brought me the chair. He brought it over in his pickup truck and we put it in the yard. And I'm like, well, how can I make this look more electric? And so I got these, what do you call the things that go on the end of the curtain rods? Fin- fennel? Fin- something like fennel or fin- finial, maybe? Finial, I think. And uh, it was like $6 finials, and you just screw them into the top of the chair. And then I got a little piece of electrical wire that comes out of a salad bowl. <laughs> it's a salad bowl that is the hat for my skeleton. And he's kind of charred looking, and he's sitting in there, but he's waving. So it's kind of a happy electric chair scene. And then the rest of my crap, all my skeletons and lights, I just sort of showered around it. But, I mean, it's pretty gaudy. You can see my house from a block away. So I can't, maybe I'm bringing property values down. I don't really know, but you know, it's just awesome. And of course we get ready for tons of trick or treaters in this neighborhood. And uh, a couple of friends of mine came up with an interesting trick or treat tradition. They use the, the October 31st holiday to clear out the pantry in their kitchen. So, They go through those shelves and it's like, oh, this has been in here for two years or whatever. I mean, nothing past the expiration, I guess. But, oh, look, it's Campbell's cream of mushroom soup. We're not going to use that. Here's some gravy packets. Here's some spaghetti noodles. Here's all this stuff. And they grab, they literally go through and sort of clear out the pantry. And then for the trick-or-treaters, they give them a choice. So the kids in costumes come up, they romp up to the uh, front door, ding dong, trick or treat, and everybody comes out and they have two piles and they say, would you like a candy, right? M&M's, Kit Kat, Snickers, whatever, Milky Way. What's your favorite candy? Mine's peanut M&M's. Okay. You can have peanut M&M's, Kit Kats, whatever, or you can have something from our pantry pile. And according to my friends, more kids... Get stuff out of the pantry pile. Skipping the sweets, it's like, oh, here's a box of Malto meal, mom. (laughs) They just put, they put regular food in the bags. Mom, I got a tiny plastic bottle of garlic and onion powder. Kraft macaroni and cheese, who could say no to that? I actually think Kraft mac and cheese would be a great Halloween uh, trick or treat candy because it's almost you know it's it's kind of a guilty pleasure. Some child walks up and it's like a bottle of olive oil. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thank you. They say the pantry pile is a big hit. I just think it's funny. I can't imagine you know gravy packets over a Kit Kat. I can't imagine that. But I just found that a funny story. Anyway, the rest of our actual ghost stories continue right now. A Girl of Nails and Teeth by Hannah Yang The girl trims her fingernails carefully dropping each pale crescent into the glass jar in front of her. Her mother stands next to her, watching, waiting. 
It's the middle of summer, and the girl steams in the heat, anxious to finish her task so she can go outside and play with the other girls in the neighborhood. She can see them through the window, their shiny bikes propped up against the telephone pole, their laughter riding the wind like birdsong. Half her mind is on the nail scissors, the other half on the laughing girls. On the third finger of her left hand, she rushes, cuts too close to the quick. Blood beads up under her nail. The clipping falls to the hardwood floor with a muted plink and scuttles under the couch. Sorry, she says. Sorry, sorry. Her mother gets down to her hands and knees to look for it. She is no longer young, and the movement takes visible effort. You're always so careless, she says as she crawls. You're old enough to know better. The girl sits on her chair, enduring her mother's quiet scolding, which ceases only when the lost nail clipping is recovered and dropped safely in with the others. They have glass jars all around the house, of all different sizes, carefully labeled and stored. Jars of the girl's hair, collected each time her mother gives her a haircut over the kitchen sink. Jars of her blood, from the phlebotomies her mother conducts once every six weeks, which are followed by a carton of apple juice to restore the girl's blood sugar level. Jars of shed skin she's peeled away from the pads of her thumbs, the calluses on her toes, the chapped layers of her lips, a jar of all her baby teeth, except for the one she accidentally swallowed while eating an ear of corn, after which her mother pulled out the rest with pliers. Her mother leaves the jars in plain sight to reassure herself of their progress. The only occasion for which she puts the jars away is when someone comes to visit. On those days, the girl and her mother pack everything into the pantry, teeth buried inside sacks of rice, blood concealed behind cans of condensed soup. Only after the jars are safely tucked away do they unlock the front door and greet their neighbors with close-lipped smiles holding in all the things they cannot say. Sometimes the other mothers burst into tears in the living room, mourning what they have not yet lost. The girl stands in the hallway and watches her mother comfort the other woman with sugar-spun lies. Yes, I feel you. I know what you're going through. We can't tell them the truth, her mother reminds her afterwards. It won't work if someone else tries the same trick. The girl is too young to understand. She waves through the window as the other mothers walk away. The simulacrum sits waiting in the back of the mother's wardrobe hidden under a spare bedsheet, a life-sized doll made of wood and linen and desperation, faceless and unfinished. It's been sitting there for longer than the girl has been alive. The mother started building it the day the doctor first told her she was expecting a female child. The same day she first put her hand on her swollen belly and felt the baby squirming inside her. A wild thing, desperate to live. The girl has not yet seen the simulacrum. She has only caught glimpses of the blueprints, which her mother takes out once a year to update the necessary measurements, the size of her feet, the circumference of her skull, the length of each arm. When the time comes, the mother will finish the simulacrum alone, It will have a perfectly painted face that mirrors the girl's own, 
It will have the girl's real blood pumping through its limbs, her real hair stitched into the pale cloth of its scalp, her real teeth drilled into its gums, her real fingernail clippings glued onto its fingers and toes lined up like the tiles of a mosaic. The mother will leave the simulacrum outside their front door and wait. Even now, after all her planning, she does not know for sure if it will work. She will spend the whole night waiting, her arms wrapped around the girl, her pulse hot and fever quick, listening to the weeping and wailing of the other mothers in the neighborhood who were not clever enough to save their daughters this way. Mothman. Point Pleasant, West Virginia, 1966. Two gravediggers working their cemetery job heard something overhead. They looked up to the sky and saw the black figure flying. Ghostly and unnatural, it was ten feet long with large wings and red eyes. These men didn't realize it at the moment but they were the first people to ever report a sighting of the Mothman. From that day forward, Point Pleasant would see more encounters. Drivers spotting the creature at night, hikers reporting a large winged thing sitting high in the trees, residents on sidewalks driven back to their homes after being followed by a pair of red eyes attached to a shadowy outline. The most famous sighting of the Mothman happened on the 15th of December, 1967. Locals reported seeing a giant winged creature flying over the Silver Bridge, a suspension bridge over the Ohio River, the bridge connecting Point Pleasant to Gallipolis, Ohio. Moments later, the bridge collapsed. Forty-six people died. Investigators found a fracture in the suspension chain, but many still insist the tragedy was the will of the Mothman. In the decades after 1967, witnesses far beyond Virginia have come forward to say they saw the Mothman moments before other terrible events. Accidents, fires, massacres, natural disasters as if this visitor brought calamity in the wake of its giant wings. Yet strangely, many see those catastrophes as merely coincidental. To them, the Mothman is merely a visitor from another plane, a spectator, even a friend. Every third weekend in September, Point Pleasant hosts the Mothman Festival, a celebration of the otherworldly cryptid. There are museums and costumes, music and guided tours. A festival for a thing few people have seen, but so many embrace. To be safe, just in case, if you ever see two red eyes in a shadow beyond, stop where you are, turn and run the other way. Within seconds, you may see a horror upon humans. Is he an agent of destruction? Or is he just watching? We do not yet know. We only know that so many say they've seen the Mothman and witnessed cruel happenings under the span of his wings.
Very often, the most terrifying ghostly creatures don't just haunt us. They consume the things around us. Maybe they eat souls or animals or our children. They devour what is vulnerable and precious. The people of Thailand have a ghost they call the Hungry Ghost. These otherworldly creatures were once human beings, people who took advantage of other people in life. They lied and stole and cheated and harmed. They were agents of inhumanity that preyed upon their human brothers and sisters in this world. In a way, they were charging up a kind of karma, prospering in the living world with the afterlife awaiting to make them pay for every misdeed, every lie, every abuse, every grift. No, they were not going to get away with it after all. Real world cretins waking up in the spirit world after death no longer themselves, at least in form, they have become the hungry ghost. If you had lived as one of these terrible people, your afterlife form would be specific to the types of wrongs you had committed. If you were stingy and greedy, you might have one form. If you had physically harmed someone, you'd have a different form, and so on. But the forms all have certain things in common. Long necks, lean bodies with protruding bellies, gray, green, or blackened skin, huge hands with spindly fingers. You're as tall as a palm tree with a head proportional to that body, but your mouth would be as tiny as the eye of a needle. Your inability to eat more than a speck at a time compounds your misery as your large stomach simply cannot be filled. You are tortured with hunger. And as you walk among the trees and the darkness of night, you make a high-pitched whine of a scream, an outward expression of inner pain. You roam as a phantom, a monster. You are slithering in the land of the living, desperate to feed. You are the hungry ghost. It's interesting that according to legend, human beings are rarely attacked by these spirits. The famished phantoms often invisible to the human eye. The hungry ghosts instead feed on other things as best they can. Of course, they are never satisfied. And they also hunt offerings. Offerings to give to the gods. They must appease the gods, they must atone for their misdeeds in life by gathering valuable things wherever they can find them, bringing those items to Buddhist temples, and then laying down their findings at the feet of the good in the hopes that they will encounter a merciful priest who will forgive and free them from their prison. The story of the hungry ghost is often told to children to keep them from misbehaving. Don't be cruel, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't harm, because if you do, when you die, you will be cursed to roam as a hideous thing, as tall as a building, with only a constant, horrible hunger at your side. You will become the Hungry Ghost. You know, myself, I find a kind of magic to this story. Wouldn't it be nice if karma was real, as we live in a world where so many terrible people get away with it, while so many very good people suffer at their hands? So oh, yes, I fantasize that these people would be made to pay after death for all the bad things they had done in life. Creatures in their hearts, as living people, they would become actual creatures, monsters, beasts, tormented spirits after death. Oh yes, I'm guilty. 
I would love to see the agents of suffering get a taste of suffering themselves until finally they bring themselves before the altar of the good in humility and penitence, regret, and change. Oh, we can certainly imagine. Still to come, two great ghost stories. To climax the broadcast, I've got a noose and a witch. Coming up next. It is the season of the witch and the ghost and the jack-o'-lantern and the black cats and the big bad spider and the vampire. So much good stuff going on here in the month of October as we continue with the final segment of Ghost Stories 2023. As so many ghostly legends come from stories about real people in real places, allow me to tell you the story of Alice Riley, which is also the story of The Hanging Square. January of 1734, there was a poor immigrant named Alice Riley. She arrived in the American colonies, and she found herself in what would one day become the town of Savannah, Georgia. Alice had had no money to pay for the trip overseas, and so she sold herself into indentured servitude and became a debt slave. She willingly sold her labor to a man named William Wise, and to pay off her debt, she would work for him for five years. Yet her master was not a good man. William Wise was oppressive and petty and cruel. He abused her every day. He insisted that he be personally groomed, washed and cleaned and shaved and combed. He enjoyed the attention that Alice was forced to shower upon him. He enjoyed the master's chair. He enjoyed his slave an attendant to his every whim, the object of his contempt, the target of his horrible temper. William was a weak man. He was weak in character and weak in body. Perhaps his abuse of other people made him feel big and strong. I suppose it was inevitable that Alice had finally had enough. She reached the end of her tether And so she and a fellow servant, a butler named Richard White, decided that they were going to end their misery. They decided they would end William Wise. The date was March the 1st, 1734. It was time for the master's bath. William again stood at the tub with expectation. Alice filled it with water. But before he could get inside the bath, Alice and Richard grabbed him by the shoulders and they thrust his head under the water. William thrashed and splashed, but in his weakness, he was helpless. He could not find the air to breathe. It was a terrible, violent, cacophonous moment until all became quiet and the master lay slumped all the way down literally dead in the water. Alice and Richard placed his body upon the bed with a handkerchief around his neck to hide the trauma to his body. What would happen now? Alice and Richard knew they would have to flee for their very lives. But soon they were captured and arrested, 
They were tried, and both were sentenced to death by hanging. When Richard was dropped from the rope and executed, Alice screamed out, I'm pregnant! I'm pregnant! The colony doctor was brought in to verify, and he did. Alice had been impregnated by the man she had just murdered. The father would be her dead master, William Wise. Well, the town wasn't going to kill a woman with William's child inside of her. She was dragged back to the jail and she was allowed to live there for another eight months. Until when the baby was finally delivered, Alice Riley again faced the gallows. In the middle of Wright Square in pre-Savannah, Georgia, with a rope around her throat and the platform about to fall beneath her feet, Alice shouted curses at the townspeople who had come to gawk at her. She cursed them, and she cursed them until this immigrant slave who rose up against her abuser was dropped to the end of the hangman's rope. To send a message to the rest of the town, her dead body was left there for three days, hanging in the breeze. At the end of the third day, Alice's body mysteriously disappeared. It is said that the newborn baby died mysteriously just a few days after that. This happened 300 years ago. Today, Wright Square is known as the Hanging Square, a place where so many others would come to die with broken necks at the gallows, the place where Alice Riley had died, the place where she had disappeared, And she has reportedly reappeared from time to time. People say they have been approached by a distraught woman asking, Where is my baby? Have you seen my baby? I've got to find my baby. Some of these people were so eager to help that they called the Savannah Police Department. This has apparently happened so very often that veteran officers immediately know it's Alice. She is said to be dressed in the clothing of her time, but few people even look twice because of all the popular guided tours in Savannah, where olden attire is common with tour guides and reenactors. Alice is both anomaly and anonymous. The red band scar at the neck where the rope had once been, walking and asking and pleading and crying and wailing, New mothers are very protective of their own babies when walking Wright Square. They're nervous that Alice Riley might see their child and somehow see her own. She might strip the baby out of their arms and disappear. The way she disappeared from that hanging noose three centuries ago. She had drowned her oppressor in the bath water. She had paid with her life and in death she roams those savannah streets. Legend says that her ghost has been seen and reported more than any other ghost in the history of the state of Georgia. Perhaps you can visit Wright Square someday, and you can find out for yourself. The old woman's house was different than the others. Older, worn down, the paint long gone, the wood a gray blue, the door midnight black with no windows. No one ever arrived or left. No one was ever seen, except for the shadow of the witch in the window. That's what everyone said she was, the witch in the window. 
It didn't take much for the neighbors to whisper about her. Who is she? Why doesn't she ever go outside? What goes on inside the house? Be careful. Something's wrong there. Not natural, not safe. Of course, what better place for a children's dare than the house of a mysterious witch? Samuel, Tim, and Michael were all 13. Classmates in middle school. The best of friends. They'd been warned to stay clear of the rotting old house. But these were young teenagers. Brash boys. Invincible in their youth. One night, from their bikes, they passed by to see something tied to the door. A string. Above that string was a large orange balloon just tethered to the doorknob and drifting in the light breeze. If not an invitation, it was certainly a temptation and the perfect opportunity to test one's courage. It was Tim who said it out loud. Go get that balloon. Just take it. Go ahead, I dare you. Sam and Michael just looked back at him. It was easy to be bold on this side of the small picket fence surrounding the weeds and thorns. Tim persisted. My dad gave me ten dollars. He pulled the money out of his pocket like a rich man flashing a thousand. I will give you ten dollars to get that balloon. His friends weren't smiling. They weren't frowning. Their faces were neutral and blank and a little bit stunned. Turning toward the balloon, they were obviously wrestling with the dare. Do it, and you're in the shadow of the witch. Refuse to do it, and everyone will find out that you're a coward. Tim dangled the money like a fisherman dangling his line, praying that one of them would take the bait. And after a few uncomfortable moments, his prayer was answered. Michael spoke up. I'll do it, but I want the money right now. No way you're going to cheat me if I do it. Tim hadn't been bluffing. He grinned and paid. Nobody rushed Michael. Even as he stood there gathering himself for the mission, his buddies didn't goad him or push him. They were happy to wait until he felt ready. And if they were to speak honestly even from a distance. They were a little bit afraid. The orange balloon was no longer moving. The curtain of the upstairs window slowly opened. The interior room flickered with candles. The shape of a woman filled the square glass. The boys were hidden behind the shrubs. Invisible. Invisible? Thirty seconds, and then she was gone. All was dark. All was still. Michael had wrinkled the bill in his hand, smashed into a ball before he saw what he'd done. All eyes were on him. Go get the balloon. Michael wouldn't use the gate. Too rusty. Too risky. It would certainly creak. He climbed the short fence and knelt down in the tall grass. He gathered himself. Then he slowly moved forward, like a soldier in battle crawling enemy territory. He made himself small. He felt himself crawl, forward and forward an inch at a time. The house loomed larger. The door crept closer. The balloon got larger. The front left corner of the house was covered in brush. This was Michael's hiding place before the final act. Get the balloon. Get the balloon. He set his jaw and tensed his body and coiled like a spring. The sprint to the door had to be fast. Lightning fast. Get the prize and get away. Breathe. 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 Here we go. Five, four, three, two, 
When Michael jolted from his hiding place and screamed toward the porch steps, five short steps that he leapt in one motion, he lunged at the door and grabbed at the string. It popped into his hand without any resistance at all. Michael fixed his grasp and boomeranged as fast as a boy could run. Away, away, away. In the chaos of his retreat, the balloon grazed his cheek. There was a flash of bright light. Then blackness. Michael's body was frozen in place, paralyzed. He couldn't even feel breath in his lungs. He was a small statue, suspended between worlds. Slowly, all around him, the black became gray. The gray became green. The green became red. The red became orange. His muscles and movement returned to him as he began to reach out to touch the sinister shade of gold and saffron that enveloped him. His fingers touched something like rubber or latex, plastic or nylon. It was meshy, elastic, sticky and thick. He clawed with his fingernails to hear the sound of hands on a party balloon, but it would not tear. The more he tried to knife his round prison, the thicker the sticky orange walls became. Watching all this from outside the fence were Samuel and Tim, helpless and petrified. They cheered as their friend dashed from the brush to the door, then screamed as he was immediately swallowed by an orange floating quicksand. The now large balloon, with the shadow of a boy barely visible inside, muffled yells barely audible. Beneath this glowing orb was the tiniest string, dangling and drifting again in the breeze. The giant balloon just hung there, still as a grave. The only movement was the flailing shadow of Michael inside, scraping and clawing and climbing for nothing. Four eyes from two faces were unable to blink. And then they looked up to that second floor window as the curtain again opened, the candles again flickered, and the shadow of the woman reappeared in the frame. Slowly, her body began to sway. As she moved, the giant orange balloon began to sway. Left and right, left and right, back and forth and back and forth. It was an otherworldly dance. Until the figure reached forward to unlock the window latch. She raised the glass. She leaned forward into the warm evening air. She pointed her long dead corpse of a face at Sam and Tim. Her eyes weren't there, only black sockets of decay. They could see hair like filthy straw, hands with unnatural fingers. The mythical witch wasn't a myth after all. With the slightest of motion, the creature in the window held out her open palms. She paused for a second, then she lifted them up. As she did, the floating round prison lifted as well. It rose upward and upward, above the house, over all houses. Higher and higher, smaller and smaller, the boy-shaped shadow inside climbing and clamoring to escape. The balloon and the shadow rising far out of view. Vanishing. Vanishing. But wait, was it there? Was it returning? Tiny, 
then bigger, then bigger. The boys on the ground held their eyes to the horizon as the round orange thing slowed and stopped in the faraway sky. It was the boy. It was the balloon. It was the harvest moon. Samuel and Tim turned towards the high house window. The shadow pointed toward them until the boys could see teeth. Blunt teeth, revealed from separating lips and a wide open mouth. The face stretched back as if pulled by some strange gravity. The witch's teeth in a hideous grin. The breeze became still. The air became chilled. The witch raised her hand, and the crone in the frame spoke aloud for the first and only time. She said in a satisfied voice, Enjoy the moonlight, boys. And then she was gone. Little Michael was gone, in a prison of both light and darkness, of stretching and symmetry, a balloon with a string that could never be stolen. No one would find him. No search would reveal him. Nobody would see or know him ever again. Except for two teenagers that nobody believed. No one will ever know that their affectionate gaze at the harvest moon sees the boy locked for life in that orange balloon. Masterful telling of that story by one of three special guest narrators for this project. A huge thanks out to Sarah Gray, to Grace Belliston, and Connor Brannigan. Great storytellers and welcome additions to Ghost Stories 2023. Thank you for listening. Happy Halloween, and we'll do it again next year. (laughs) 